Chapter 300 Continued Video 3 Palooka Change by Robin Gilbert Promote your business here And there, proud against the sky, the rotunda, provincial pantheon to the guards of gain, conceals a bank. I recoil, tutting at the vulgarity of the times, where profit is all, profit and the cult of self. So different then, when Joseph Pitt laid out his plans for a patchwork paradise, where gentlemen might live like gentlemen, where facades whose elegance we treasure now concealed the goings-on within, the jerry building at their back. The Mysterious Windows by Roger Turner Long may they last, these dusky shadows, these old neglected corners, nettle-fringed retreats, these inaccessible gardens and these mysterious windows. If you shine too bright a light, dissect too much or hyper-analyse, the things you put great value on under the glare and stare of the casual passer-by soon look ordinary and diminished. Not only places, not just this secretive house, behind the curls and convolutions of its cast iron balconies, the green and airy veils of the plain tree branches, its mask of slender glazing bars and its reflective windows. But in myself as well, let me have mercy on my own unsorted corners, my quiet places, self-justifications, secret inconsistencies. So do not ask me, please, for the banality of some glossy, garbled version of my life story, particularly on first meeting. Let us instead surprise ourselves, allow the delicacy of hints of shadows and reflections, let us retreat into some uncomfortable room where I in time may be willing to bring out my treasury things old and new, an inexhaustible supply. Tennyson in Town by Judy Marsh and did he find a camelot among his, our halls and gardens, and after settling here for a while, think no more the days that were. Many a time he wrote and listened to others speaking and writing of their own nightly deeds. A tram, a train, a terminus, a station, theatres, regency houses, taking time for Tithonus. Summer shade beneath the chestnut trees, strolling down the promenade, tea at the Queen's Hotel. Dies the hidden world, hides the dying world. It dies only in hidden dreams and lies in memoriam. The park is glorious, pitiful at its best. Trees, reed-fringed lakes, and ducks, coots, moorhens swim and squabble. But oh, the swan, elegant, stately. She could sail to Camelot, that swan, she could sail to Camelot. Host by Michael Newman You stand in sculpted glory down imperial gardens about to conduct the planets. Your fame is assured a concert given by your hometown to celebrate the living you. 
and Hardy of Fan, the poet, listening to a shellac recording of your masterpiece on a gramophone. Wait for it, owned by Lawrence of Arabia. All this a far cry from your pinch-penny beginnings. Take Wick Risington, the agony and the ecstasy, that eighteen-mile trunge along tumble-twist lanes, just to play the organ at sung Eucharist, and then back, nominal pay, if that, a jester's purse of the Charlton lad. But now, with baton poised, you stride planet Earth, raising it above all others, and with your intrepid friend, Vaughan Williams, you collect forgotten folk songs from the very villages you once trudged, ill-worn through. You are supplicate, turned advocate, music your universal passport. Naming an Immortal by Robin Gilbert Gloucestershire play Warwickshire, the college ground awash with eye-glassed Rupert Smiths, languid past masters of leg spin, a camaraderie of cricket, cut glass accents and shot cuffs. A perfect Edwardian afternoon, and there at once boated and blazered he had played truant from the beastly bank to revisit schoolboy scenes of triumph at the crease. He's in his element. A few years on, perched on a Brooklyn bar stool, he wrestles with a fresh idea. A plot has taken shape. The characters are there. Only their names elusive as a nephew when an aunt's about. His mind meanders back across the years, the miles, first to Dulwich, then to Cheltenham, and that visit to his parents' home, the county match, those confident accents, the bowler whose action he admired so much, and dependable echo of a summer evening past, he shimmers in. What ho, Jeeves! Three, around Cheltenham. Getting Lost by Stuart Nunn. What's Cheltenham like? asked my wife. I've never been. So I drove her round, spying GCHQ, then Regency Boulevards, wide walks and gardens. Did I drive up High Street? Who knows? As always, I was lost round the back of somewhere, never anywhere like Charlton for getting lost in. Bath Road I thought I recognised, maybe. Churches, a college, a hospital. But we were due at the stadium and this was pre-Satnav. I really was lost. Someone's following us, she said. And suddenly I was a special agent in the film of my life. Pull over, see what he wants. Are you following us? Yes, since you left Yate, we thought you knew the way. Trams at Pitful Gates by Michael Scaife Dingerthorpe Two trams to and from Cleve Hill, passing Pitful Gates before the war, but which war? Perhaps the first, we know they lasted till the second. That was the dramatic route, the one most photographed, with single-decker trams on the steep incline. The top deck on the hill too dangerous, people were required to change cars at its foot. But when I go past Canby Place, I imagine that the tram is waiting there, to go to Leghampton, and somehow this is more real to my mind than any exploits on Cleve Hill. It's as if these trams had never happened, 
a coherent memory for ninety years, but nothing much preserved, no film that's known of, just a rotting tram somewhere in Gloucester or Staverton. Glimpses of Hester by Michael Scaife Dingerthorpe. Hester's Way Farm in Charlton was demolished in 1951. An ash tree on its own in long gone times was thought by some to house a woodland sprite, became a local landmark, and the path from there was known as Ash Tree Way. So when a farm developed near the road, the local people called it Ash Tree Farm. And when a legal name was needed for the deeds, that was the name which naturally was used. Some years, years or decades then went by until the farmer chose the name of Hester's May for his young daughter born to him that month. And so she was baptised a few days on. As Hester May grew up, she was a beauty at Ash Tree Farm with all the family. None were boys, she helped to work the farm as best she could when she was old enough. She was a prize with prospects of the farm, increasing her allure for local lads. Thus many trod the path to Hester May, which was of course a road called Ash Tree Way. Like Queen Elizabeth I, she stood them off against each other, favour, favoured none, preserving thus the farm in her control, when, on her father's death, it would be hers. For years the situation stayed the same, when suddenly she died, no one knows why. Her father lived there still, was left to choose, who would inherit when the time should come. The people in the area mourned, thinking the farm would soon have come to Hester, and so her father called it Hester's Way, as it remained until it was knocked down. This glimpse of Hester ended with her death, but she is still remembered. Where I live, the area bears her name, Hester's Way. She may return from ash, we hope. Some day. Home Time at Hester's Way by Michael Newman. The mouth organ grills of cars play a dissonant theme. Disembodied voices float across the school playing field, but now the pavement agitates with a gust of young mothers. Decibel overload, they chew over the day's stale gossip. The forecast was for snow, and a few desultory flakes do flutter by, otherwise February dull ditched. I rush to buy my takeaway pizza, end up lengthening the queue. I could do the conga, twenty minutes is a long time for a short fuse. I emerge to a centripetal petal squirrel of flakes and the telltale crunch underfoot. The spruce trees are white pagodas now and benches fur up like kettles. I duck as the first snowball comes my way, resist the urge to retaliate.